Perfect. All right, so a few housekeeping items before we get underway. First, I'm Katie Hepner. I'm the Executive Director of the Economic Alliance. We are the Economic Development Corporation that serves Wadena County, Minnesota. We've been co-hosting these coffee talk since March 2020. Every two weeks uh, with my partner Dean Uselman, the Wadena Development Authority. Shout out to Dean, see you on the screen. Uh, today we're having a very special edition. It's our second annual legislative lattes, keeping with the coffee theme on a Monday morning. Uh, and we're really pleased to be joined by Congressman Pete Stauber and Representative John Poston. Thank you both so much for making Wadena County part of your Monday morning. Uh, <laughs> a couple more housekeeping items. One, uh, please feel free to put your questions in the chat or unmute yourself when it's time for Q&As. Either one works. The second rule, which is kind of new this year, is because it's a uh, campaign year 2020, uh, we're going to keep all questions non-campaign related. We're just focusing on legislative priorities today. Uh, I'm sure both gentlemen would have things to say campaign related, but we're gonna try and stick to the job at hand. I'm sure there will be opportunities to hear from either of them in the future on any of those kinds of updates. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to our first speaker, Congressman Pete Stauber. So great to see you today. Well, Katie, thanks for being here. And Dean, it's great to see you. Um, and to everybody on the on the call, I want to wish you all a happy new year. Um, you know, I spoke to a group uh, last week. Um, and, and let's make 2022 the best year possible. Let's make it better than 21. You know, we've been through some tough times together and uh, lots of stuff going on. And and uh, but uh, as as many of you know, I live my life. The glass is half full. I'm optimistic about 2022. Uh, we have some work to do. We know that. Um, and especially with, you know, when we look at our small businesses, the devastation that has happened to them, you know, since since this uh, uh, COVID crisis, you know, the the uh, PPP uh, was um, was well intentioned. Uh, it did a lot of good, but. We, there were some there were some blind spots within it and and so we wanted to work those out and I will just tell you that that uh, uh, we have to protect our small businesses and my concern right now is uh, some of the the, the increase in taxes uh, you know on, on the on the, on the pass through of small businesses and and I think that uh, we need to really look at that and make sure that we don't that, that we give our small businesses the best opportunity to succeed coming out of COVID. Um, and I think that one of the ways is to allow uh, those owners, those business owners to keep as much money as they can um, and not, uh, not uh, you know, give more to the federal government than, than absolutely needed. Um, and also on the capital gains, um, you know, I think that the taxes and the capital gains, we have to keep them um, reduced and as low as possible because we know that they reinvest into the communities, into our local communities, uh, right there in Wadena. Uh, Wadena County is a, a, a great example of of what uh, has happened when you work together. You know, I was uh, in Wadena and we had some small businesses um, that uh, were struggling and, and uh, the, the city of Wadena allowed the expansion outdoors into the parking areas on the streets. I mean, that's, that's really good um, uh, communication, good work on behalf of the business community uh, and um, the elected officials to, to, to make that happen. You know, a couple of things that uh, I just wanna mention I mentioned small business and we know that the small businesses are the engine of our economy and we must protect them at all costs. And then um, one of the other things is the childcare. Uh, we have some uh, major childcare issues. Um, and uh, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, I have uh, supported legislation that allows 501c3s to be able to get loans from a small business uh, administration. Uh, historically, they haven't been able to. So we're working on that to be able to have that quicker or quick access to capital that they need um, if they're going to, uh, you know, enter that business. Um, and then, you know, if we go on the bigger scale, if we look at uh, securing our southern border, uh, bringing our energy prices down, um, and making sure that uh, uh, we can reduce uh, inflation, bring it down. We are now at almost a 40-year high as uh, inflation um, 
you know, comes about and we can do better. I mean, we've had uh, pay raises, et cetera, that have been just eaten up by inflation. And, and uh, I, I've said that inflation hits the middle and lower class the most because most of us live in the middle and lower class uh, and it can be devastating on us. So you're seeing it from the groceries to the gas to uh, our everyday items that we use. And so I think we can do better um, and we will do better. And it's, uh, you know, I have the responsibility, the opportunity to, uh, you know, to really work in our nation's capital on behalf of uh, our small businesses and, uh, and uh, you know, those that took the risk to get into business. Um, I, I also want to talk about the infrastructure. So the infrastructure bill has passed. Now it's important that our um, legislators and our federal elected officials get together and, and really prioritize those projects within our specific districts. Um, and it's gonna take uh, a lot of work. It's gonna take the, the cities, the counties, the townships, MnDOT, for example, to be part of um, the, the conversation. And, for, and, and as John Polson knows from the state level, there's gonna be a 20% 20, uh, 20 match that uh, is gonna be required. So, um, you know, we have the uh, uh, excess um, um, you know, monies within the state, but um, we really have to look at those projects that are going to be beneficial uh, to and around the state, and make sure that we've got that twenty percent match available uh, to get these, um, you know, to get these projects done. Then, of course, broadband. Um, I have been on uh, the uh, you know working the broadband bipartisan broadband issues for almost uh, three and a half years now, and I think that we have we really have the ability to. Uh, do a lot. We through COVID, we've spent uh, billions. We've invested billions of dollars into it. Now we have to see the fruits of that money, and that's the frustration that's happening around the country. With the where is the fruits of of the investment for broadband? And uh, you know, um, if if you look, there's there's opportunities to uh, not only invest in broadband, um, you know, uh, the traditional way. Uh, through uh, the uh, uh, fiber optics, but there's also opportunities uh, to go from tower to tower when it's feasible, when it works, when the geography is there. And my goal is to allow the, the local communities, the local elected leaders to make that decision. Uh, we have uh, not only in Morse Township, for example, just outside Ely, Minnesota, the tower to tower, but in Chisago County, uh, the southern part of our district. Uh, uh, went tower to tower to hook up the people. So I think it's, uh, I think the, those are the priorities that, that uh, not only locally um, helping our small businesses, but even at the national level. But I've mentioned some of the really high, uh, high priority issues that uh, are, are concerned to us. And I think we can, we actually can work on them and fix them with good uh, proper legislation that makes it, uh, um, uh, that, that makes the investment wise and uh, the, the return on the investment even better. So those are some things, those are the priorities I wanted to share with you all. And, and I also wanted to say that constituent services is our number one priority. So if there's an issue uh, within uh, and around Wadena County, give us a shout. If there's, if, that, if there's that federal nexus, we want to be able to part, we want to partner with you, be a part of the solution. Uh, and give you uh, good ideas to make you successful. So uh, with that, Katie, I'll, I'll turn it back to you and uh, we'll look, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, John Polston's comments and then looking forward to the conversation. All right, thank you so much. You covered so much in such a small period of time. I don't know how you do it, switching gears so quick, but uh, thank you for covering all that you did. Uh, we're gonna pause right now for questions for you, if you don't mind. Oh. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself. We have to have some questions, Katie. Well, I'll get. I'll ask you one to get started. Sure. Uh, Build Back Better passed in November. What's going to be the impact on our local communities uh, moving forward? Well, um, we'll see. I mean, it, it passed the House. Yeah. It has not. It has not passed um, the uh, the Senate yet. Um, I I want to be real clear. I voted against the Build Back Better. Uh, it's going to be the most historic tax increase in American history, um, and many of the items never went through regular order. Never went through the committees. Uh, just like the transportation and infrastructure package that passed, 
many people don't know, it never went through the House Transportation Committee. You are, you are looking at the only member of the House Transportation Committee, uh, and it never went through our committee. No transparency, no markups, no opportunity for amendments, and that's not how you govern. When you, when you govern, it's my way or the highway, that's not the way to do it. I've always said that uh, to be able to be effective, all voices have to be in the room, and then we can have that conversation. And then when you when that bill comes out of the all voices, it's a really good bill, really good bipartisan bill. And uh, so the Build Back Better uh, is, uh, uh, as you know, it needs uh, uh, at least fifty votes, uh, uh, fifty one in the in the Senate to uh, to to pass. And it looks like Senator Manchin is going to attempt to pare that down. But I just want you to look at it's not the cost. It's not the cost. Look at what's in it. I want, I want you to know that there's 150 new federal programs in here. There, there is in this, they want to hire 86,000 more IRS agents. We currently have 75,000. They want 86,000 more IRS agents to monitor $600 or more of, of a deposit or uh, takeout within our banks. The, 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 the American Banking Association, Minnesota bankers are absolutely uh, against this. There is some really devastating stuff in Build Back Better. Um, and there is some good stuff, let, let, let's be fair. There are some, there are some good items. Uh, but the way this was brought to the American people, um, again, it just was thrown on the house floor. No input from ways and means, energy and commerce, education and labor, natural resources, small business, zero. And so I, I, I think that um, the Senator Manchin is, is going to attempt to pare it down and remove some of those items that, you know, when you have 150 new programs, I want to share with you all, so you understand this, that the Congressional Budget Office uh, uh, was asked to give um, their numbers on the Build Back Better uh, according to what the administration wanted. So the administration had a program uh, that they wanted to the Congressional Budget Office to just look at if they instituted it for one year. And then the, ne the next three programs instituted for the two years. And then the next, let's say 10, instituted for one year. That's not how it does. When you institute a new program at the federal level, and there's 150 of them, you do it for 10 years. Historically, the Congressional Budget Office, when they institute a new program, they look out, they give you a 10 year window lookout. Um, and we um, asked the Congressional Budget Office to take this, build back better, these 150 new programs and give it a 10 year look because that's traditionally and historically what you've always done. And you're looking at $5 trillion. I mean, because you're not just going to implement these programs for one year or three years. You want those permanent. So let's do what we've always done. Uh, and you're looking at $5 trillion. We're at, this country, uh, Katie, is at a $30 trillion debt. That's $263,000 per taxpayer in this country. You know, and that's why um, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of talk on both sides of the aisle on a balanced budget amendment, um, uh, the Constitution, um, a balanced budget amendment, a constitutional amendment that says that the, the, this country must balance its its uh, uh, budget, and that's going to be that's going to take a convention of the states uh, to do that also. But I think there's some really um, I think there's some strong sentiment to do that, Katie. Thank you for your comments on Build Back Better. It's been so much in the news. I don't know. I'm sure you all have seen it that I want to make sure a question got asked on it because it's important that we know your perspective on it and that you share what your experience with it has been as well. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions now that I got the ball rolling? Feel free to just unmute yourself. Hi, Katie, this is Rachel. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Johnson. I'm the Yellow Ribbon Outreach Coordinator for Minnesota. I apologize. I'm driving. So if I get cut off, I will put it in the chat box when I pull over. But my question was in regards to employment. We have like a ton of jobs in Minnesota and working with all of our um, bigger employ employers out there in the state. How are we going to be helping to get those jobs filled? 
are there any plans or anything coming? And maybe John knows too, but I just wanted to get that out there because um, all of our communities are trying to figure out ways to get people to um, get back into work and fill up those spots that are open. Right, no, um, um, <clears throat> Rachel, great question. So one of the things that, that we know uh, that, that doesn't work is to pay people more to stay home. And I'm gonna give you uh, numbers that are uh, almost accurate, uh, very close. So uh, if the median income in our district, Rachel, is $55,000, that's the median income per year. Um, and um, if you as an individual, you are an able bodied uh, individual, able to work, but you decide you choose not to work, you have uh, the ability <clears throat> to sign up for the programs that are in place right now. And if you add those up, if you, if you meet every criteria for every program, you will make $41,000 a year not working. Um, and you look at that, the median income, somebody that works um, 2,080 hours a year that may, you know, they make 55,000 the median. And, um, and uh, some people that are able-bodied to work don't work they get 41,000 when they meet all these criteria. That's not, that, that is not how we energize the workforce and get people in the workforce. What we need to do is we need to really understand and support the dignity of work. The fabric of our country is hard work. The fabric of our country is to work um, and every job matters. Uh, no matter what it is, uh, it's important that uh, that uh, we take and support these jobs that um, that are open right now. And we have to have a we have to change our thinking in this country um, that uh, and and put work as as a priority for our families, as a priority for our communities, and as a priority for our neighborhoods. We need these jobs filled, and I think that uh, as we uh, as we get through and push through COVID, um, we're going to see we're going to see a lot of. Uh, um, you know, a lot of these jobs are hopefully being filled. And one of the things that and I'll share this with you, we had a business owner that called a former employee, small business owner that called the former employee and said, you know, we'd like you to come back to work. We're short staff. And the individual responded, I will come back to work when my benefits run out. When, when did that become part of our mentality that, 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 that you're going to come to work when your benefits run out? That's not who we are as Americans or Minnesotans. And so we have to change that culture. Um, and, and we do that uh, by, for example, um, that, that you, if, if you are going to uh, be, if you are an able-bodied adult with no dependents, you should be, be able to work. I mean, we have, there's millions of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs, even in our great state that are open. Every job has dignity. And so Rachel, I think that we must, we must push that and make sure that our young people understand that every job matters. And, and I, I don't care what job it is, it's important for uh, our community. We need uh, the, the workforce to be uh, strong and healthy and vibrant. And again, the dignity of work is so important. Katie, if I can jump in for a sec. Go ahead. Uh, Rachel, I, you know, I agree with uh, what Peach has said. I just wanna also add that you know, many of these jobs are what I would call jobs that are going to come out of a trade school education and community college education. And uh, that certainly is a priority for us going into this policy session. And uh, we know here in our neck of the woods how fortunate we are. I know you've had uh, President Charlier on a few times, you know, talking about things that are happening at Central Lakes College, but that, that is not just Central Lakes College, but all of those schools are very, very important. And, you know, young people are starting to shift from four-year college, you know, into some of those careers. And those are the ones that we need filled the most. So we'll continue to work hard on that. It's high on the priority list. Thank you. That's well said, John. Well said. Thank you. Thank you both. Any other questions for Congressman Stauber? Feel free to unmute yourself. You know, Katie, if I can again just say something to Pete. Yep. Um, you know, Pete talked about broadband, and I and I know that Pete is a huge advocate for broadband, especially in Greater Minnesota. Um, I'm a little concerned because you know our the budget got really cut 
I, I and, and Pete, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the initial money for broadband was $115 billion. It ended up being $65 billion in the bill. Um, and unfortunately, the state of Minnesota is only getting $100 million of that. And I have to tell you all that by the time that $100 million enters into the state of Minnesota, and by the time the Metro takes a chunk of it, greater Minnesota is not gonna have an awful lot of money. So, you know, the state put 70 million in, it looks like we'll actually get less, um, maybe out in greater Minnesota than that from the federal government. And I know that, you know, my job this yeah. year is gonna be to be the squeaky wheel and I know Pete will be too. And, you know, we gotta get more monies out, uh, out into greater Minnesota for broadband. Thanks. Uh, Katie, Katie if I, I'm going to add to what John just said. So right now, I want to share with you what's happening in our nation's capital. Uh, right now, we have, um, there, there is a rural, uh, rural and metro divide. Uh, we have metro um, uh, members of Congress who want to upgrade their metro areas. They, they have high speed up and down, but they want to even make it better and bigger and healthier before rural Minnesota or rural America even gets it. So that's the fight we're having. <clears throat> and right now, uh, and this is a bipartisan effort uh, in our nation's capital to make sure that rural Minnesota and rural America are taken care of. And let me give you an example. Um, in, in, in the Build Back Better plan that, uh, uh, that uh, hasn't passed the Senate yet, I wanna share with you 71% of federal highways are in rural America. Do you think rural America gets 71% of that investment for the roads? I can tell you, no, that is not true. And so this is, this is the fight we're having. Uh, Wadena County matters. And so some of our uh, legislators in the, in the big metro areas don't understand uh, what we do, why we do it, uh, and the struggles we have. Um, and we talk about broadband. Broadband is here to stay. Look at the um, uh, 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 look at the uh, telehealth telemedicine. We have to stay competitive. We have to have our technical colleges and our colleges and universities competitive. We have to have um, the the broadband in in, in every house uh, in rural America. We have to stay competitive. We can't fall back. And that's our job, John and, and I and others, to pr promote rural. Uh, investments uh, into broadband. And I'm telling you what, it's a fight because the big <clears throat> metro areas want to upgrade theirs uh, and, and, and add more before rural America gets our share. And that's unacceptable. Um, and I'm fighting every day to make sure that rural Minnesota and, and, and Wadena County matter. Thank you so much for sharing that passion for our rural areas. Uh, <laughs> you're definitely speaking our language here in Wadena County. I joke with some of my uh, Metro colleagues in economic development that when I used to office out in Sabika, I didn't have a single stoplight on my way to work, but I did have a lot of farms uh, and that always <laughs> shocked them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, thank you for sharing that. Any other questions for Congressman Stauber before we move on? Petey, Ricky Utek, I have one. Yeah, I appreciate everything you guys are doing uh, for um, to help with rural broadband. And uh, hopefully we can come to some conclusion. Have you heard anything on RDOF, what the FCC is planning to do on that or, or correct things on that or? Uh, Rick, I have, Rick, this is Pete. I haven't, uh, there hasn't been a lot. I haven't been uh, part of that, uh, much of that discussion at, 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 at this moment. So. You know, we'll we'll see what happens, and and I think that uh, again, um, the, the again we need to uh, uh, we have invested since COVID uh, billions of dollars to broadband. Now we have to we have to look for the fruits now, and uh, it's frustrating because uh, we haven't seen it uh, as much as as much as we should. But to direct it to your question. Rick, I haven't, there hasn't been a lot of discussion that I've been involved in. I, I appreciate yeah. the answer. Well, we have uh, in Todd County, as well as a lot of other counties in, in your district, uh, 
we're stuck with uh, RDOF being, you know, uh, getting in the way of trying to do progress for broadband. Yeah. But thank you. Yes, I, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question. It's very timely. Any other questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Am I hearing anyone? Going once, <laughs> going twice. All right, thank you so much for uh, your report and for answering the questions, Congressman Sauber. We really appreciate it. Sounds good, I'm looking forward to hearing John. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, everybody. Perfect, and what a perfect segue. Uh, Representative Poston, you are no stranger to our coffee talks, but we're excited to highlight you this morning and hear what you have to say. Well, good morning, Katie, and uh, good morning, everybody, and happy 2022 to all of you. Uh, and I have to kind of echo what Pete said, uh, 22 is going to be a lot better than 21. And I have to tell you, I've been kind of living vicariously through Pete's first couple of days of 2022. I've been out on the snowmobile with him through social media. You know, I was down at, I was down at the Target Center watching a hockey game at you know, 20 below zero or whatever the heck it was, you know, he's out showing our way of life for sure. And uh, 22 is off to a good start and it is going to be a better year. Um, for the Minnesota legislature, uh, this session uh, that we go into at the end of the month here is going to be our policy slash bonding session. Um, and uh, we do have a few bonding projects in, in our district. Uh, that we're that we're working on, uh, the Batcher Block Opera House is one of those. You know, we're we're working on that. And Katie, I know that you know through your husband what's going on there. Uh, so we hope to get that that first piece over the finish line, so we can get it engineered and so on. Uh, a policy session, uh, just to give you an idea, I could talk about a lot of different policy things that are probably coming along. But in our last policy session, we had uh, we had 5,000 pieces of legislation uh, in the Minnesota legislature. So a lot of the things that we've dealt with over the past few years are gonna come right back around again and come up. Uh, I'm gonna work on our projects and I'm gonna work in the areas that you know, are most important to our district. Um, we are going to, in the Minnesota House, unfortunately, again, have a remote session where we will not be uh, many of us in the chamber. So we'll be in the chamber, I guess, if, we, if we're presenting a bill or if we're involved deeply in a debate, otherwise we'll be in our offices, we'll be at home and we just won't be there in person, which is not a good thing uh, for, for the legislature. It's not a good thing for any of you. It's very hard to get our voices heard when we're doing everything over Zoom. Now, this Zoom this morning is awesome. Works really great. Katie, you got this thing figured out. It, it works fantastic. But try to, try to picture you know, 200 people on a Zoom and, and try to picture us being on there for 12 hours, 15 hours, 20 hours, uh, holding debate, taking votes. Um, it, it's really clunky. It's really time consuming. All of, our, uh, all of our meetings are also done that way. And many times we don't get to ask questions and, and express concerns. And that means we don't get to talk on your behalf. So I, it's, a, it's a little bit unfortunate. Um, it's also a redistricting year. And I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Uh, redistricting is, is happening and that's gonna be a big part of our session. Um, uh, to, to let you know how where we're at on that right now, uh, the House GOP and the House DFL, uh, the, the Senate uh, GOP and the Senate DFL, we've all uh, put our maps in. And as you can imagine, no one's agreeing on those maps, okay? So when no one agrees on the maps, the maps go to the Supreme Court and they make the decision. And I've seen, I've seen four or five versions of the map so far. And I have to tell you, I'm just not paying a lot of attention. Uh, they'll be finalized on, on or before February 15th. And that's when I'll start paying attention. 
when we actually have a map because everything we're looking at right now is just you know people's ideas and the supreme court's going to have to make that decision so you know that's a it's a long long process that should have been done by now unfortunately it's going to be done very late because we can't uh, agree to agree um the biggest issue probably uh in this upcoming session is the surplus that you all keep hearing about and actually i don't like to call it a surplus i like to call it over taxation um you know we have an awful lot of money that's sitting in the state coffers and we're going to have to make some decisions on what to do with it um you know for me the first thing we need to do is change that over taxation you know right now every quarter we're adding about 80 million dollars to the state's coffers over taxation every single quarter of the year and so there's no reason to continue to tax at the rate we are and continue to accumulate more and more money so you know some things that we're certainly going to try to do is eliminate tax altogether on social security uh really really important i think to get that done uh we're one of only a handful of states pete might know this but only a handful of states that still do that um that that has just got to change um we have a lot of things that we wanted to do with some of the surplus that we haven't done yet uh because of the governor primarily not wanting to put us into special session. Um, you know, we, we've, you've heard a lot about the frontline uh, worker bonuses. You know, those are still up in limbo. We'll have to decide on that money uh, when we get in session. We hopefully will get the drought relief uh, passed immediately when we get into session because uh, Wadena County is very affected by, by the drought uh, that we've had and continue to have. So you know those are those are some priorities um, that we that we have to get through. Um, the The unemployment tax issue is one that uh, you know again is an area that we're one of the only states left that is not used that surplus money or that money that came from the federal government. Uh, to pay off that unemployment tax. Instead, we're charging small businesses. So, you know, we've, we've got to make, uh, we've got to make a change there. Uh, one of my priorities, uh, this, this may sound really simple, but it's going to be really hard to get done with $7.7 .7 billion and growing um, in those coffers. You know, we're going to have a bonding bill that's going to be somewhere in excess of a billion dollars. I think it'd be a great idea if instead of borrowing that money, we just pay for it. You know, we, we have the money, we ought to just pay for it. I think that we ought to pay down some of the debt that the state already has, that we're paying a tremendous amount of interest on. Um, so those will be a couple of the things that, that I'm going to certainly work on. Um, you know, the amount of debt that the state has and the amount of debt service that we have, it's probably the right time to take some of that money, not all of that money, but some of that money and pay that down so that our kids and our kids' kids don't have to continue to pay as much. Um, I serve on public safety. Public safety is certainly going to be a big issue this year. You know, you've been hearing about you know, the murder rates in St. Paul and in Minneapolis, uh, the problems that we're having with uh, getting law enforcement officers uh, to fill positions with, with certain police uh, forces. Um, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of work that's going to have to be done and a lot of money that's going to have to be spent, I believe, to fill these positions from the highway patrol to the county sheriffs uh all the way through to the metropolitan police departments and for that matter all of our municipality police departments um, so public safety policing uh is, is going to be a very high on the priority list uh pete mentioned child care that's a big deal in wadena i got to tell pete a story i had uh 
a couple of uh, child care operators from Wadena call me about six months ago or so. And uh, they have an operation where they have 14 children. And there's, there's two of them there and 14 is what they're allowed to have through state statute. Uh, but their building would easily hold twice that many people. And they have people that, are, that they can actually hire to manage more people. But the state is just saying, statute says you can have 14. If you wanna have more than 14, open a second daycare in the same building. But if you do that, you have to have separate heat, you have to have separate air conditioning, you have to have a separate kitchen, you know, you have to have all, all these rules and regulations go into place and it makes it very unaffordable to do. But the landlord, last time I talked to him, would have to put about $30,000 into the building to make that happen. And uh, you know, he's not willing to do that. He's not going to get the return on the investment uh, for a long time if he does that. So it's just, we're, we're kind of caught up in bureaucracy. We're caught up in statute. Our agencies like to just point that statute, never think outside of it. Uh, they don't try to fix problems. Sometimes they just try to refer to statute. So we do have a lot of childcare work that we have to do. I have a, a little grandson. I think, actually, I think he's been on here once. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he's 10 months old and uh, he's getting, he's getting uh, childcare, but by a relative right now. How much longer that's going to uh, be able to uh, be in place, I'm not sure. And where he will go from there for, for child care, I'm not sure, because it's hard to come by. My daughter's been looking now uh, since he was born, you know, for appropriate child care. And it's, it's really a problem in greater Minnesota. So we'll work hard on that. Um, I chair the, uh, the Legislative Water Commission. And I will tell you that uh, the Water Commission is gonna be very active this year. We're working on 15 pieces of legislation that cover uh, every aspect of water from lakes and rivers to uh, irrigation, you know, to wastewater, you know, uh, anything that has to do with water. And we're all very concerned about water in the state. You know, that's our life. You know, our water is a big part of our, a big part of our state, big part of our tourism big part of you know why people come to Minnesota and a big part of why we all want to live here. So um, the Water Commission will be very, very busy. Um, I could talk about lots of legislation that's probably uh, coming uh, down the pipe, but I don't think it's, it's, it's really worth the conversation until it does. And I'll be happy to be on these calls as often as I can, even during session, uh, to try to update you on things that are happening in St. Paul. And, um, you know, I just, just a, just a point, you know, Pete said constituent services are, you know, his number one priority. They are mine too. Uh, communicating uh, is, is one of my priorities. And I do have to, you know, say thanks to Pete because uh, Pete with his busy schedule back and forth to Washington and all the stuff that he has going on meets with, state legislators uh, once a week on Zoom. And, you know, it's a great way for us to stay connected to Pete and for Pete to stay connected to us. And it's really appreciated, Pete, that you do that. It, it means a lot, it means a lot to us. Um, you know, with that, I'll just say that I, I also serve on uh, K-12 education policy. Um, I serve, like I said, on public safety uh, and criminal justice reform. And I serve on uh, vets, military affairs and labor. So if there are any questions in those areas, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. And uh, Katie, with that, I'll just say uh, uh, the first thing that Pete started out with, 22 is gonna be better than 21. And I'm excited to get uh, into St. Paul and get started. Love that optimism. And just like Congressman Stauber's report, yours packed a lot of topics into a small amount of time. Uh, both of you uh, have to be commended on being able to keep all those straight. Uh, <laughs> must be a difficult task. 
We already have a question in the chat I'm gonna, from Tom. I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud. Uh, Minnesota unemployment just increased the base rate as the fund was in deficit last March because of COVID. Any chance we can see legislation to use the federal COVID funds to refill that fund rather than take more from small businesses? Yes. That message is from Tom. Tom, that is exactly <laughs> what we're going to try to do. Um, and, and most states have already done that. I, I Pete may have a, a figure on that, but uh, I think when I looked last, there were 30, more than 30 states that had already done that, and, and we have not. I think that if I may add, uh, Tom, that's a really good question. We want to be able to um, help uh, bring that investment into the unemployment insurance for the states because, you know, we know that. Um, we know that uh, through the pandemic, that was that, that was important. Um, but I think that uh, you know, with the with the investments into helping the state, respective state coffers in their uh, unemployment insurance, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, yeah. You know, we have to work together with the states, and and I will tell you this that that <clears throat> not only in unemployment insurance, uh, but the uh, the PPP the fraud that we are seeing, uh, for instance, just in the uh, PPP and the EIDL loan, there's over $100 billion of fraud that the Small Business Association, uh, administration rather, has, has found. And we want it, we want to go after these people because it was never meant uh, um, to, to be used fraudulently. And so, you know, we have to, we, we have to look at at, at that's taxpayers' money. We want to make sure that we get that money uh, back, uh, and then help the states. I mean, we can, as John said, the federal government and the states can work together on this issue. I don't think, I do not think, uh, at this point, that we leave it up to the states to to you know fill those uh, unemployment insurance coffers back up. We they need some help, and and that's where I think that. Uh, that working together uh, um, in a parallel path can help our respective states, all 50 states, not just Minnesota. And, um, you know, I'm committed to, uh, in the Small Business Administration, um, to look at the opportunities that we have to do just that. Um, uh, you know, so I, I do think there's going to be, uh, and there should be an investment uh, to help our respective states. Thank you both for your responses to that question. Does anyone else have a question for Representative Poston? Feel free to unmute. Or throw it in. Go ahead, Marlon. Quick question for John. I'm very happy to see that you're uh, working on, uh, this is personally, on uh, not taxing Social Security. <laughs> but yep. my, my main question is, uh, uh, when, did, when did you say we might have a clearer picture of redistricting? Uh, February 15th is the deadline. All right. Thank uh, you. So it'll be, it'll be on or before that, but I, I suspect it'll come right down to the wire. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question, Merlin. Anyone else? Feel free to unmute. Oh, it's easy today, Katie. It's really easy. Everyone must have that post-holiday Monday morning. I mean, you're really hitting us at quite the time. Ah. What do I have here in that? Nothing. Katie, I have a, I can just jump in. Yeah, Chet. Uh, thanks, Representative and Congressman, for joining. I, I'm really intrigued on the child care stuff. I'm Chet Bodine. I work for the uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development in the state here and region, have for a long time. And the the child care stuff is just so so big and it, it touches every part of our communities yeah. as you guys know and um it touches like social aspects and economic ones you know we're talking about workforce and getting people back to work so yeah. we've been talking about it a lot um with a lot of people and it's really encouraging to hear that from you representative poston that there's um discussions about trying to develop some some innovative policy around that. So I guess I just was hoping, I know you said you didn't want to get into talking about, you know, some legislation too much, but have you seen some innovative ideas come, come across and any that are really sticking out to you? 
Yeah, the biggest the biggest issue right now is is what I described a little bit ago that that limit of fourteen um, is is really a concerning pro problem. Uh, in in the case that I spoke of, there are many people right now running away from the child care business. You know they they you know they're closing up. We've lost a lot of them over the years, as you know you probably know better than I do. Um, and in this case, we got two uh, two ladies that are trying to grow a child care business in Wadena where it's really, really needed. And they can't go beyond that 14, even though they have a facility that's much larger, you know, can accommodate much more kids uh, than 14. And, you know, they they uh, they have the people to operate it. Uh, we've got to change some of those regulations so that people like that can can do that can make their business bigger, take more children uh, and grow. And, and that's, I'm working on that with the revisor's office right now uh, to see what we can do with that statute to try to make a change. And I'm working with you know several of the agencies on it as well. So hopefully we'll be able to get that done. I think that would make a huge difference. It's, it, there, there are so many regulations that, that uh, cost these people so much money and it's scaring so many people away from this industry, we just have to make some changes. And I may reach out to you at some point in time and uh, and and, and uh, use you as one of my resources, if I may. Yeah, of course, uh, Representative. Um, I'll tell you that, I mean, that's for sure a thing as far as, um, you know, just the limited amount of slots and, um, but, you know, and hiring those workers, right, is also difficult, you know. It's, right. One thing we say is it's it's hard to expand childcare if you can't find childcare workers too. You know. Yep. So. I was I was surprised when I talked to these ladies that uh, you know the size of their facility, uh, the quality of the facility, and the fact that they had childcare workers lined up to take positions with them. And 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 they were just getting the answer was just no. Statute says this, so no. We, we, we can't we can't do anything outside of statute. We got to figure out uh, in, in our agencies uh, when they're confronted with something like this and we have this kind of a uh, crisis going on, they got to start thinking outside of the norm and coming up with solutions and making some changes and asking you know for legislative changes if need be, you know to, to help these people succeed. Uh, that sounds frustrating. I thank you for working on it. To, yeah, you got uh, it. Appreciate it. You bet. I did have on that child care thread, I had another question come in to me. Uh, Dina Malone wants to know, uh, what can we do at the local level, you know, to help help change things and help improve things, you know, uh, as related to child care? Uh, well, you know, I... Katie, I have to say that, you know, I, I often say this, and I said it earlier about broadband, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So we need to be squeakers uh, about this issue for sure. Um, but I got to tell you, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to convince people to go into this business. It's tough. You know, it's a tough business. And, and as a state, we've made it really, really difficult. So we have, to, we have to make some changes and then maybe we can get people excited about this as a, as a business or as a career. Uh, right now, they're not. So that's what we'll work on. Well, we'll try to squeak as loud as we can. Uh, we did, Perfect. we are in the middle of going through the Rural Child Care Innovation Program with First Children's Finance. Uh, as a county, and when they did their 2019 uh, study, they found there's over, their higher estimate was over 500 children in Wadena County currently yeah. going unserved. Yes. Um, and that was 2019. Chances are that didn't get better because of COVID. I, I, <laughs> they haven't redone the numbers, but if I were a guessing woman. Uh, yeah. We do have on the line Candace from First Children's, who I saw had unmuted herself earlier. Candace, is there anything you want to add to this childcare conversation? Oh, thanks, Katie. Um, 
I would just say definitely to reiterate what everybody's saying, you know, there is concern in the industry, the limits and the regulations with providers, uh, you know, in that 14 limit, that is two child care providers, you can operate up to 14, but you have to have two providers. So right. you have to have a second staff, not, you know, and so that, and that's just to gain two additional children. So that is not cost effective for providers. Um, you did mention a little bit of what seemed to me to be the pod model um, theory of having, you know, one one building or one central location where you could have uh, family child care providers in that building. I know in July there's probably going to be some changes coming you know, that we've heard of with being able to have some additional folks um, operate those pod models. But yeah, those are all concerns. One other thing we're hearing in the industry, especially from providers, is that issue of no benefits. So I know that's something that you have your eye on and others do as well. But that's just such a game changer for these individuals who want to make a living in this industry. So yeah. thank you for the work that you're doing to uh, help providers in the region and the state. Thanks, Candace. Any other questions uh, for Representative Poston on childcare or any other topic? Feel free to unmute. Trying to look at all your little red. <laughs> John, thank you again for your work on this. this is, uh, um, when you say uh, we need to squeak, let's be clear, who do we need to squeak to the most? Well, you know, I, I, th I think squeaking to our counties, um, you know, squeaking uh, through, uh, through the counties and to me, you know. Uh, <laughs> squeak, squeak, you know, squeak. Squeak, <laughs> squeak. Yeah, I, 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 I will say this, Dean, and, and, I, and I think Pete would probably um, say the same thing, but, you know, when, when we get a lot of communication from a lot of constituents about a specific issue, that issue tends to go right up to the top of our priority list, right? And, and this is on the top of my priority list right now. There, you know, there's a handful of things that are. Uh, this is, it's very frustrating. So I'm, I'm squeaking to uh, the legislature. I'm squeaking to um, you know, the agencies and so on that are involved. Uh, but this is, you know, we've gotta, we've gotta change some of the, the demands and so on that are put on these folks to get this to be a better business a business that people want to be in. And Candace, in this particular case, uh, with the 14, they do have two operators and they had they have uh, two or three other people that are interested in this. So they could very easily have, you know, 20 some in this building. Um, and, and that's the frustrating part. You know, again, Dean, people are running away from this business, not running to it. Right. And, the, and these people are running to it and want to make it into a bigger, better business. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Representative Poston. And I would just like to ask those that are listening here or on the, on the Zoom, um, send an email to Representative Poston and express this in writing, how important this is to our area uh, so that he can take that up the ladder. Uh, we can be on a Zoom here, but and 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 express our concerns. But unless they get to a Representative Poston, uh, especially in writing, uh, in an email, uh, so that he can take it up the ladder and and have something to back his words, um, it makes it makes his job a lot easier. So um, let's all help him out by uh, uh, help him to help us by uh, communicating on an email. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. You're welcome. Thank you, Dean. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute. Going once, <laughs> going twice. All right, well, 
Uh, thank you once again, uh, Congressman Stauber and Representative Posen for joining us. I think this is a great way to kick off our new year, knowing what you two are up to and you hearing what we're up to here in Wadena and what's important to us. So I think you're right. 2022 is going to be the best year yet. Uh, and thank you so much for helping us kick it off this way. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. And yep. uh, for everyone on the call, uh, our next coffee talk will be Monday, January 17th. So I look forward to seeing you then. Take care, everyone. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs>